The traditional Christian belief about Jesus, found among most Christians of most denominations throughout history, is that he was both fully God and fully man. He was not God the Father, but he, with the Father, was fully God. And yet, he was fully human as well. Many Christians even today will say that that is what they believe, even though at the end of the day they don't think that Jesus really experienced the limitations involved with being a mortal human. Some of my students think Jesus could have spoken Swahili as an infant if he had wanted to. For them, even though in some sense he was human, he was really God. In this lecture and the one that follows, I'll be arguing that this understanding of Jesus as God does not go back to the lifetime of Jesus himself. I'll be trying to show that Jesus did not call himself God or think of himself as God, and that during his life, this is not what his followers thought of him either. The idea that Jesus was God came about only after Jesus' life and death. We have already seen that scholars have wide-ranging understandings of who Jesus really was and what he really said, did, and experienced while living. Was he a great rabbi who understood himself to be an interpreter of the Torah? Was he a zealot rebel who believed in a political overthrow of the Roman Empire? Was he a social reformer, a kind of proto-Marxist or a proto-feminist? Was he a cynic philosopher who believed that people should be concerned only with the spiritual things of this world and not the material world? Or was he an apocalyptic prophet, someone who expected that God would soon intervene to destroy the forces of evil and set up a good kingdom on earth? Or was he something else? The reason there have been so many disagreements is because our earliest sources about Jesus' life, the New Testament Gospels, are not fully accurate representations of Jesus' words and deeds, and are highly problematic for reconstructing the events of his life. As it turns out, there are no other early sources for knowing about Jesus outside the Gospels of the New Testament. My students sometimes wonder, what is it that Greek and Roman authors say about Jesus from his time? What do pagan authors have to say about Jesus from the first century? The answer is that pagan authors have nothing to say about Jesus from the first century. If you take every pagan author that we have from the first century, the century that Jesus lived in, whether you look at poets or philosophers or historians or natural scientists or religious scholars, you look at any pagan author of any kind whatsoever, you will not find any discussion of Jesus at all. His name is never mentioned. Now, that should not be used as it sometimes has been to argue that therefore Jesus probably did not exist. Uh, this is a radical view that sometimes you find, but in fact, uh, it's a bogus view. Uh, when one asks what pagan authors said about Jesus, one has to compare that with what pagan authors say about other people from the first century. The most important person in Jesus' lifetime in Palestine, where Jesus lived, was Pontius Pilate, who ruled as the governor of Palestine from 26 to 36 CE. And what do pagan sources from the first century say about Pontius Pilate? They don't say anything about Pontius Pilate. He's never mentioned in them either. My point at this stage is that if you want to know about the historical Jesus, you can't go to what Roman and Greek authors were saying about him because they don't say anything about him until after the first century. We do have some Jewish scholars from uh, Jesus' day who, uh, whose writings survive. One of them does mention Jesus. The first century Jewish historian Josephus is a uh, is an author who's provided us an abundant amount of information about first century Palestine. He mentions Jesus on only two brief occasions in his writings, but he does mention him, enough to show that he knew that Jesus did exist, that he had a following, uh, and that he uh, had a reputation for being a brilliant teacher, and that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
If we want to know about Jesus, then, pagan and Jewish sources of the first century are not going to help us very much. But what about other Gospels? There are other Gospels outside the New Testament. We know of about 40 Gospels that did not make it in. Can those help us know about the historical Jesus? The sad reality is that the non-canonical Gospels, even though they're valuable for seeing how Christians were talking about Jesus in later times, they're not valuable for knowing about Jesus himself because all of these other Gospels, with virtually no exception, are late and legendary in character. The only exceptions are possibly the Gospel known as the Gospel of Thomas, and maybe the Gospel known as the Gospel of Peter, but even these are second century productions and not very useful for knowing about the historical Jesus. Is it possible that there are other discussions about Jesus, though, within the canon outside of the Gospels? There are four Gospels in the New Testament, but 27 books. What about the other 23 books? Unfortunately, they don't tell us much about Jesus either. The other 23 books of the New Testament, for example, the writings of the Apostle Paul, have other things that they're interested in discussing, not the life of Jesus. Which means whether we like it or not, whether we're Christian or not, whether we uh, want to have things differently or not, the canonical Gospels are our only sources for knowing about the historical Jesus. So what can we say about these Gospels? The New Testament Gospels are usually dated to 35 to 65 years after Jesus' death. 35 to 65 years after his death. So if Jesus died around the year 30, our first Gospel, Mark, may have been written around the year 65, the last of our Gospels, John, may have been written around the year 95. It is important to stress that these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do not claim to be written by eyewitnesses. Nowhere in these Gospels do the authors tell us who they are. Every one of these Gospels is anonymous. It's also important to note that Jesus' own earthly followers, like Jesus himself, were lower class Aramaic-speaking Jews living in Palestine. These Gospels, however, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not written by Aramaic-speaking lower-class Jews living in Palestine. These books are written in Greek by highly educated Christians living elsewhere outside of Palestine decades later. It's almost certain that these authors, whom we continue to call Matthew, Mark, and Luke, even though we don't know what their names actually were, it's almost certain that these authors wrote down stories that they had heard that had long been in oral, oral circulation. In other words, when Mark decided to write his gospel, it wasn't that he was there to see these things take place, it's that he had heard stories about Jesus. The stories of Jesus that Mark has heard would have been stories that were in circulation for 35 or 40 years. Stories circulated by word of mouth, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, after Jesus' death, before our first gospel writer got a hold of them. The later gospel writers also wrote down stories they had heard, or sometimes they wrote down stories that they had seen in writing, which, uh, which writings were based on earlier oral traditions. We all know what happens to stories as they get told and retold over a period of time. It doesn't take long for a story to change. It doesn't even take overnight. What happens when stories are being circulated for decades in different countries, in different languages? Well, inevitably what happens is the stories change and some stories even get made up. That's why there are so many discrepancies in our surviving Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are many differences that you might say, well, this, that's just a different but a difference, but it's not a contradiction. But there are also discrepancies, contradictions in minor details, but also in major claims being made about Jesus and in, an, in their overall portrayals of who Jesus was. In my great courses on the, on the historical Jesus and on the New Testament, I give numerous instances of these kinds of problems. 
Here, I can simply indicate that they exist. We don't have time in this course for me to show you that these kinds of discrepancies are there. Scholars, because of the discrepancies in these Gospels, have had to come up with rigorous historical criteria to help them evaluate the Gospels as historical sources in order to establish what we can actually know about the life of the historical Jesus. The situation is this. We have these four Gospels. They have a number of discrepancies. They're based on oral traditions that have been in circulation for decades. They are each advancing their own themes and their own perspectives on Jesus. But the historian wants to know not only what is this perspective for this gospel, or what is the portrayal of Jesus in that gospel, the historian wants to know what historically happened in the life of Jesus. What can we say about the history of the man's life? Scholars then have come up with criteria for using these gospels to help us get behind the stories in order to get to the history. And there are three criteria that scholars have typically used. First, since the stories of Jesus had been circulating for decades, being changed, sometimes being made up, and then the stories uh, are then later written down after they've been heard, if we have stories that can be found in a number of independent sources that have not corroborated with one another, the stories corroborate one another in the way they tell, tell their incidents, those stories are more likely to be historically accurate than stories found in only one uncorroborated source. For example, in a number of our sources, we're told that Jesus came from the town of Nazareth. These sources are independent of one another. The result is, well, maybe Jesus actually did come from Nazareth. A number of our sources indicate that Jesus associated with John the Baptist prior to his own ministry. This is found independently in a number of sources. So the conclusion is, well, Jesus very likely associated with John the Baptist. Second criterion. If we have stories or sayings of Jesus that do not simply express what the Christian storytellers would have wanted to say about him, or if we have stories and sayings that actually go against what later Christians were saying about Jesus, those stories or sayings are more likely to be authentic because those are stories and sayings that early Christians would not have made up. As an example, in our early Gospels, Jesus is said to be baptized by John the Baptist. That not only is found in multiple independent sources, it's also the kind of story that an early Christian would not have made up. Why is that? Because in early Christianity, it was understood that the person being baptized was spiritually inferior to the person doing the baptism. But what Christian would make up a story of Jesus being spiritually inferior to John the Baptist or anyone else? Moreover, John the Baptist was baptizing people for the forgiveness of sins. Who would make up a story that Jesus was uh, being baptized for the forgiveness of his sins in early Christianity? Well, the early Christians thought Jesus was sinless and that he was superior to everybody. So they wouldn't have made up his baptism. Why then do we have stories of his baptism? Because he was probably baptized. Third criterion. Any story or saying of Jesus needs to be plausibly fit within the historical context within which he lived, that is, in first century Jewish Palestine. If it cannot be located in first century Jewish Palestine, it simply cannot be accepted as historically accurate. For example, we have a number of later Gospels. Sometimes some of these Gospels are called the Gnostic Gospels because they were popular among Gnostic Christians who believed that it didn't matter that you believe in Jesus' death and resurrection, but that you, you had the correct knowledge. Greek word is gnosis. You had the great, correct gnosis, and this correct knowledge is what would give you salvation. In these Gnostic Gospels, Jesus proclaims all sorts of mystical and mysterious teachings that sound very peculiar to our ears and would have sounded even more peculiar to the ears of first century Jewish pa Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Jews. So 
Those sayings of Jesus almost certainly did not go back to first century Jewish Palestine. Scholars who have applied these various criteria do indeed come up with different results, as we've seen, but one understanding of the historical Jesus that has dominated scholarly discussions for over a century now, and, uh, and with which uh, th that scholars today continue to support, is one in which Jesus is understood to have been an apocalyptic prophet. Apocalypticism was an ancient Jewish theology that insisted that this world that we live in was controlled by forces of evil. But God would soon intervene in history to overthrow these forces of evil and usher in a good kingdom in which there would be no more pain, misery, or suffering. It is widely thought that Jesus himself held some such apocalyptic view. This view is called apocalyptic because of the word from Greek, apocalypsis, which means a revealing or an unveiling. Jewish apocalypticists believed that God had revealed or unveiled to them the heavenly secrets of what was soon to take place here on earth, when he destroyed all that were opposed to him and brought in his kingdom. This worldview of Jewish apocalypticism was dominant in the first century in Palestine, as we know from numerous Jewish writings of the time, including the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of documents that were discovered in 1947 that were written by Jews living not too far from where Jesus himself lived and living at just about the same time. Based on our study of the Dead Sea Scrolls and of other Jewish texts, we can, we can argue that in fact, there are four major components to this ancient worldview I'm calling apocalypticism. First, Jewish, apocalyptic, Jewish apocalypticists were dualists. Dualism then, is the first component. As dualists, apocalypticists believe that there are two major fundamental forces in this world. There are the forces of good and there are the forces of evil. And everyone and everything participates in either good or evil. There's God on one side, there's devil on the other side. There are the angels on one side, there are the demons on the other side. There's life on one side, there is death on the other side cosmic forces that are in control of this world, good and evil. This cosmic dualism, this battle of good and evil, has a historical component, which is also dualistic. Jewish apocalypticists said that the present age we live in now is controlled by the forces of evil, but there's a good age coming in which God will rule supreme. And so you have two ages, this present age, the age of evil, the age to come that is good. It's not hard to see that this age is evil with earthquakes and famines and droughts and floods and hurricanes and you name it going on. This is an evil world, but there's going to be a good world to come in which all that is uh, evil and opposed to God will be destroyed and God will rule supreme. The second component of Jewish apocalypticism is pessimism. Apocalypticists were pessimistic about the possibilities of life in this age because this age is controlled by the powers of evil. We can't make things better in this age no matter what we do. Even improving technology, advances in science, improving the welfare state, changing the healthcare laws, whatever you want to do is not going to make things better because the powers of evil are in control now and they're going to make sure that things only get worse. Jewish apocalypticists then were pessimistic about the possibilities of life in this age. Third, vindication. God was about to overthrow these evil powers and vindicate his name, his world, and his people. God was going to intervene in history by sending a savior from heaven, sometimes called the Son of Man, who would destroy all that was opposed to God and judge all the people of earth. 
punishing his enemies and rewarding his followers. This judgment would come not only to those who were alive at the time, but also to those who had already died. Apocalypticists, Jewish apocalypticists, were the ones who developed and promoted the idea of the resurrection of the dead, when at the end of this age, all who had previously died would re-enter their bodies to face judgment. No one should think that they could side with the forces of evil, prosper, become famous and powerful and rich, and then die and get away with it. They can't get away with it because God's going to raise them from the dead and force them to face judgment, and there's not a sweet thing they can do to stop him. But when is this going to happen? Imminence is the fourth characteristic of Jewish apocalypticists. They thought that the end was imminent. Apocalypticists believed that they were living at the very end of the age and that very, very soon it was all going to come to a crashing halt. Truly, I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come in power. Those are the words of Jesus himself. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. The words of Jesus, Mark chapter 13, verse 30. Jesus of Nazareth uh, himself appears to have held such, apocalypt uh, such apocalyptic views, as these are the ideas that he proclaims in our earliest surviving sources, especially our three first Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In these Gospels, Jesus' preaching focuses on a coming kingdom of God, which would be a real kingdom, actually here on earth, where the righteous would be rewarded, but the wicked would be excluded. Jesus' first words in the New Testament, in our earliest gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus says, The time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. What does this mean? The time has been fulfilled means that there's a certain amount of time that's been allotted to this current age, and it's filled up. The kingdom of God, the new age to come, is almost here, and so people need to repent and prepare for it. Jesus maintained that this kingdom of God that was soon to come was to be brought by the Son of Man, a cosmic judge from heaven. We've seen the Son of Man in talking about the book of 1 Enoch and the book of Daniel. Jesus talked frequently about the Son of Man. Jesus' sayings about the Son of Man are highly complicated and difficult to understand because in some of the sayings, Jesus appears to be talking about himself, and in others of the sayings, he appears not to be talking about himself. My view that I argue for more strongly in my other courses on the historical Jesus and the New Testament, my view is that the historical Jesus, the man himself, almost certainly did not think that he himself was the Son of Man. Now, it's true that in the Gospels he does call himself the Son of Man, but it needs to be remembered that the Gospels are Christian texts written by Christian authors who have heard their stories about Jesus from Christian storytellers who for decades were changing these stories, including the sayings of Jesus. For reasons we'll see in a later lecture, the later storytellers believed that Jesus himself was the Son of Man, and so naturally when they told their stories about Jesus' teaching, he calls himself that. But as I've indicated, in some of Jesus' teachings, he appears to be talking about someone other than himself. It is those sayings about the Son of Man that appear to go back to Jesus himself, not to his followers, because when his followers made up sayings of the Son of Man, they made out that Jesus himself was that one. Those sayings in which Jesus seems to differentiate between himself and the Son of Man are ones in which Jesus speaks about a cosmic judge of the earth who is bringing destruction prior to the appearance of God's kingdom. For example, Mark chapter 8, verse 38. 
Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of that one the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes on the clouds of heaven in the presence of the holy angels. So whoever is ashamed of me, of that person the Son of Man will be ashamed. If you didn't already think that Jesus was the Son of Man, there'd be nothing in the saying to make you think so. Jesus is apparently talking about someone else, a future judge of the earth who is going to bring destruction in his wake. That's when the kingdom will come, when all else is destroyed. In the kingdom, there would be a serious reversal of fortunes. The people who have sided with the powers of evil now have prospered because they're on the winning side in the present age. They're the ones who are powerful and mighty. It's the lowly and the oppressed who are on the side of God. But when the kingdom comes, it will all be reversed. That's why Jesus says, the first shall be last and the last first. This wasn't simply a clever one-liner he wanted to give us so we'd have something to say in the grocery store at the end of a long line. This, in fact, is something that Jesus believed. Those who are in power now would be taken out of power. Those who were oppressed now would be put into power. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted, and all who exalt himself, themselves will be, will be humbled. This Son of Man is bringing judgment on the earth. Jesus likens it to a fisherman. The fisherman throws in his net, brings it in, it's full of fish. He takes out the nice big fish and he keeps those, and the fish he doesn't want, he throws away. Jesus says that's what it's going to be, it's going to be like when the Son of Man comes. The Son of Man will come, and some will be taken into the kingdom, and others will be cast out. How can one ensure that one will enter this kingdom, this kingdom of God that's coming? Jesus was very Jewish in everything he had to say. He was a Jewish apocalypticist, but he was also a Jew like every other Jew who understood that the law of God had been given by God and it expressed God's will. Jesus believed that one had to obey the law of God as expressed in the scriptures. A Jewish lawyer, one expert in the Jewish law, asked Jesus, well, which laws are the most important? And Jesus answered by quoting two laws that he saw as summarizing everything else in the entire Torah of Moses. The first is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. That is the first and great commandment. And the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do those two things and you can fulfill what God requires of you in the law. The problem, of course, is people don't do those two things. They don't love God above all else and love their neighbor as themselves. No, they just love themselves. If their neighbor is hungry, they don't feed them. If, they're hungry, if their neighbor is thirsty, they don't give them to drink. If their neighbor is in prison, they don't visit them. If their neighbor is sick, they don't uh, try to heal them. In order to enter the kingdom, one has to love one's neighbor as much as one loves oneself. But also, entering the kingdom means trusting God as a child trusts a good parent. God is a good father. God can be trusted. And those who have faith in God as a young child has a faith in, in his or her parent, that is the person who will enter into God's kingdom. In this future kingdom, there would be a king and there would be other rulers. Jesus taught that his 12 disciples would be rulers in the future kingdom of God. They are following him now and they will be ruling under him then. But when is it going to happen? Jesus insisted that in fact the end was very near. It was right around the corner. This apocalyptic idea that the end was very near had a very practical effect. If people are suffering now, if they're suffering oppression now, or injustice now, if they're hungry now, if they are being abused by others now, 
if things are not going well now, if they'll just hold on for a little while longer, it'll be better. Because the end is coming soon. How soon is it? As we've seen, Jesus said that those who are standing there would not die before they saw the kingdom of God having come. Those who follow Jesus' teachings of love and mercy and justice and compassion were already beginning to see that kingdom of God in their lives just now. That's why for Jesus, the kingdom of God was like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds, says Jesus, when you plant it, but it grows into an enormous bush. The kingdom of God is like that because the kingdom of God starts small in the lives of Jesus' followers who begin implementing the ideals of the kingdom. In the kingdom, there will be only a utopian-like existence where people will be treated justly and fairly, where they'll be loved and they won't suffer, and that's happening among Jesus' followers now in the present, and so it's like that small mustard seed. The kingdom is beginning to be realized in the present, but when the Son of Man arrives, it will take over the earth. Jesus, in short, was a Jewish apocalypticist, one who expected the imminent end of history as we know it and the miraculous arrival of a judge from heaven. This judge from heaven would bring in God's utopian kingdom here on earth. But what did Jesus think about himself? Did he think that he was God on earth? That is the question we'll be addressing in the next lecture.